Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest installment in Green Thumb's Open Orchard School webinar on fruit tree graphic grafting with fruit tree expert Sam Ben Aiken. Um, my name is Amber Qureshi, and I'm an outreach coordinator here at Green Thumb. I'm here with my colleague, Babby Dunnington, and um, we're really excited to get started to uh, let you know there's going to be a question and answer session at the end around 11.45 today. If you've got any questions for our fruit tree export expert or anything else, feel free to type them into the chat. I'll do a little sample for you so you can get used to it. Feel free to include your questions, your comments. Where we can, we'll um, interrupt Sam and include the questions as you ask them. And if not, well, we have time at the end of the session for you for, uh, to include your questions. So please feel free to include whatever you want in the chat. Feel free to introduce yourself, name uh, where you're from if you like. If you belong to a Green Thumb Garden in New York City, please let us know what it is. We're happy to see you all. We really thank you guys for tuning in during these very tumultuous times. Um, we appreciate that you're here and uh, we're happy to have you. So let's get started. I'm gonna turn the stage over to the Director of Public Programs at the Trust for Governor's Island, Shane Brennan. Take it away. Thank you for coming. It's a really great turnout. I know it's early on a Saturday and really appreciate taking the time to tune in for this workshop. Um, so again, my name is Shane. I'm the Director of Public Programs at the Trust for Governor's Island. And really quickly, for those of you not familiar, Governor's Island is a 172-acre island in the middle of New York Harbor with a mix of historic buildings and open public spaces, including a really 43-acre park designed for climate change. Um, we also have a program um, that involves commissioning new work by artists who are exploring the relationship between the island and New York City history and really big questions about climate and the environment. Um, and we've been really lucky to work with Sam Van Aken, um, who's leading this workshop today over the last couple of years as he's been developing his project on the island called the Open Orchard. Um, which is where the name of this workshop series comes from. Um, and that project is going to take the form of a public orchard of hybrid fruit trees. And those trees will contain rare and heirloom varieties of fruit that once grew in and around New York City, um, often in gardens much like yours, um, but which have disappeared due to climate change and industrial scale agriculture. So the orchard is going to be planted in the ground soon, hopefully in about a year. Um, but in the meantime, Sam has been growing the trees in a nursery on the island, and he's been using the process of grafting, which you're going to learn about today, to make each individual tree grow four or five different types of fruit, um, something I didn't know was even possible until I met Sam. Um, so grafting, to me, at least seems kind of magical because it allows peaches and plums and nectarines and cherries all to share the same branches. But for the Open Orchard project, it's also going to serve this really important and practical purpose, since it's going to allow the orchard to preserve hundreds of varieties of fruit on just 50 trees as a kind of living gene bank. Um, and these are varieties, again, that no longer grow in our region, and they represent this really incredible biodiversity that has otherwise been lost from our food system. So I wanted to give you that background and hopefully, you know, sooner on the island, you'll be able to come see the trees in the nursery in person. Um, and when the orchard is planted, you'll be able to eat a peach that hasn't grown in like 200 years, which is pretty cool. Um, so I'd like to encourage you to all check out our uh, website, Governor's Island website, um, and our newsletters, and follow along as the project that Sam's been working on for so long takes root on the island. Um, and of course, I hope you'll sign up for more of these workshops. We're hoping to do a whole series over the course of the summer with our partners at Green Thumb, and we'll also hopefully again be able to have in-person workshops as soon as possible. Um, so thank you for coming, um, and I'll hand it back over to Amber and Bobby to get us started. Thanks, guys. Um, a quick reminder that um, <clears throat> to keep yourselves muted, we'll try to mute you as we um, as you come in, but it'll be a lot easier to hear Sam when uh, everybody's muted. Feel free to put again all your questions and comments in the chat. Sam, I'll give this give the mic to you. 
Great. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll try to um, remove all the magic from grafting here today and kind of make it pretty simple, hopefully. Um, so I'm uh, it, my mother block of fruit trees. Um, so a mother block is a group of trees that you'll grow in order to harvest the branches to use for grafting. Um, so these are all in various stages uh, between sort of four to six years old, and they all have uh, you know, at least five to six different varieties grafted to them. Like in the background, you can probably see these white marks are all where grass have been placed on the trees. What I do is I'll come out, these trees grow about eight feet each year, and I trim them down and I take all of the small branches. I collect the previous year's growth and I put them into these plastic bags, um, put a damp towel in the bottom of the bag, and I hold them in a refrigerator just above freezing, so 34 to 36 degrees. And then I can use the material for grafting uh, throughout the year. So I have a bunch of varieties here today and we'll, um, I guess we'll just get started. So um, pretty much all fruit trees uh, that you'll find now are grafted. And um, the reason why they're grafted is because the seed of a fruit tree is a genetic variant of the parent. So if you picked a um, hundred apples off of a tree and planted all of the seeds from them, you would come up with several hundred different varieties of apples. Uh, and that's a uh, adaptability trait within the fruit tree that um, makes it so that it can, uh, you know, it's better for its survival. What that means though, is that when we find a variety that we wanna propagate and um, continue to grow, that uh, you need to do clonal propagation, also known as grafting. So grafting has been around uh, you know, for at least 3,000 years. Some people say it's been around for 5,000 years in China. Uh, in the United States, it's been around since just about 1730. And um, the first grafts in the US were done by the William Prince Nursery, which was in Flushing, Queens. And up until that point, um, the native varieties of fruit that were available were crab apples, uh, American plums, so Prunus Americana and uh, Prunus Maritima, which is a beach plum, uh, which was most likely growing on the shores in Manhattan. And so those were all cultivate, cultivated by Native Americans, the Lenni Lenape. And um, so starting about 1600, when the Dutch came, they brought cherry varieties with them, which were quickly adopted uh, by the Lenni Lenape cultivated up and down the Hudson and then uh, along Long Island as well. And most fruit trees were propagated by seed up until the early 18th century. So what people would do is they would just take the seeds from the fruit, plant them out, and apple trees were primarily used for cider. Um, peaches, plum varieties were used uh, for feeding livestock. And William Prince and the Prince Nursery were actually the first ones to introduce grafting. At that point in France, they, they had done heavy, uh, you know, there, there were a lot of uh, significant horticultural practices. And so they not only imported the fruit varieties uh, from France and from England, but they also introduced those horticultural practices. And many of them really haven't changed uh, until today. So, um, I think today we're going to be grafting one cherry type and then a bunch of different plums that uh, were originally offered by the Prince Nurseries. They started publishing catalogs starting in 1771 and going to about 1834. And all the varieties that we're going to be grafting today are from um, our varieties that they offered at that point. So today, if you're going to graft a fruit tree, you're going to order a commercially grown rootstock. And it'll come something like this. Uh, it'll be packed in newspaper, uh, sawdust. And they typically, one of the problems you have is that, you, you know, I don't know of a place that you can't buy less than 25 of them. Um, so you need to order quite a few. Um, and you'll, they'll come with a root structure already on them. Um, some of the most common varieties, or at least the ones I use are, uh, this is a Mirabilin plum. And I'll use a Mirabilin plum for all of my plum varieties and all of my apricot varieties. Uh, for peaches, I use Lovell, or you can also use Bailey rootstock. Um, 
for apples, I'll use M111. And so I, I grow standard size trees. So these are all trees that, that are gonna get like 20 to 30 feet tall. And you can order the root stock in essentially three different sizes. Uh, you can order standard, which is the largest, semi-dwarfing, which keeps the trees at about 15 feet. And you can order dwarfing varieties that'll keep the trees even smaller. Most commercial apple orchards are, are now, um, they're all doing uh, dwarfing root stock. The trees are planted three to five feet apart. And it looks a lot more like grape growing than it does uh, what you would traditionally think an apple orchard look like. Um, so I, some of the best sources I, I know for root stock, at least if you're, you're going to buy on a smaller scale, are uh, rain tree nurseries, uh, which is out in Washington. And um, they'll sell all of the stone fruit and some apples. Fedco trees in Maine, um, they sell apple rootstock as well as scion wood for grafting. So uh, you can order the parts and put it together. The one thing that I highly, highly recommend in all of this is that you're getting um, rootstock that has been virus tested and is disease free. Uh, there's several different uh, viruses that affect stone fruit trees in particular. Um, so those are uh, prune dwarfing virus, uh, necrotic ring or necrotic ring spot virus. Um, and then also like things that are devastating like plum pox virus. So you wanna make sure that all of your, your root stock that you're getting has been tested or comes from disease-free sources. Um, in addition to that, you also wanna make sure that your budwood is, is coming from, um, from, from reliable sources. Uh, it's not a good idea to go out and um, just collect branches off of trees because you don't know um, you don't know what the, what's wrong with the original tree. And grafting is one of the ways that you can communicate diseases pretty readily between fruit trees. So for all of these trees, I mean, I have there's about 200 varieties here, and I've had all of them um, tested at this point. Actually, I try to you know try to do it just about every other year to have them tested um, to make sure that they're disease free. And, um, you know, I, I keep this mother block in my backyard so I know sort of where, you know, what trees it's coming into contact with and so forth. So let's get to grafting. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a Mirabilin rootstock. And what we're going to do is we're going to graft. So this is a uh, St. Catherine plum. Um, so this was one of the original varieties offered by the Prince Nurseries. And... I'll show you how we go about doing this. Um, there's several different um, grafting knives. We'll go through all of them. But one of the things that I tend to like to use is a utility knife because I can replace the blades pretty readily and pretty quickly. And so the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a diagonal cut. that's about an inch long, something like that. Then what I'm gonna do is come down two thirds of the way here and I'm gonna put in a notch like that. Then what I'll do is I'll try to go over to my root stock and I'm going to try to mimic that cut. And I want to try to make sure that they're the same length. So I can see there it's a little off right now. Hey, Sam. Yeah. The picture's a little bit blurry. I wonder if you could get a bit okay. to the camera. Thank you. Okay. Is that good right there? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Great. Go. Yeah, that sounds, that looks better. So a few things that I'm looking for is I always try to uh, graft or get, they call this scion wood, right? Any branches that you collect during the winter, store till the next spring, they call scion wood. I try to find it so that it's about pencil width. And then I'm trying to graft on to pencil width stock. What I'll do is I'll come in and so I'm looking, so this is the scion wood right here. And what I did is I came two thirds of the way down. If I have the root stock right here, I come one third of the way down and I put in a notch right there. And then what I do is I slide them together so that they hold like that. And then what I'll do is, um, I use electrical tape 
And um, so there, there's several different materials for grafting, and we'll kind of talk about those in a little bit. But let's go through this again. I take those two notches, slide them together like this. Try to line them up, and I'll put tape on them. So the whole key to grafting is to match the candial layer on the uh, on the rootstock and on the scion wood. So if you when you cut a branch, you'll see this green layer, and that green layer is the inner bark, and right below that is a cambial layer of the tree. So if I'm using branches that are the same width. When I line them up, I'm matching the cambial layer. And it's essentially the vascular system for the tree. So as that heals, you'll get a successful graft. Trim off and excess. Then um, what I'm going to do then is count three or four growth buds. So if I go one, two, three, four growth buds, I prune above it and I cut it at a diagonal. And you want to have it at a diagonal so rain doesn't sit on the top of it. And then what I'll do is I'll put a little sealer onto the top of it. And that's ready to be potted. Um, I can take this, put it into a pot, and um, hope it grows about two or three feet this year. So that's pretty much how all fruit trees are grafted. Um, yeah, so and it, it's kind of amazing to see it like at a commercial level because they'll, they'll graft thousands of them. So they'll all be in the ground and they're cutting and grafting off of the ground. So, yeah. Can you share the name of that sealer? Oh, yeah. So um, I'll even hold it up. It's Tanglefoot. Um, and it, it's an asphalt based sealer. And since I'm based in Syracuse, that it's pretty cold here. And I don't know, I have this, you know, theory that um, that asphalt based sealer, just because it's black, it helps heal the wounds more quickly. So, um, yeah, similar to doing sort of these in-ground um, grafting, we'll graft a, a cherry variety. So, as I, I mentioned, um, most the first cherries that, that were grown were actually all from seed. But uh, starting in the mid-1700s, the Prince Nursery started to, to offer varieties of, of peaches that came from Europe. And one of those varieties was called the yellow Spanish. So this is a yellow Spanish cherry. Uh, I'm gonna graft it onto Gisela rootstock. And we're gonna use a technique that they used uh, you know, back in the 18th century. So um, the way that they used to graft trees is a, a different type of graft called a cleft graft. So you would cut the top off of the tree then what you do is you'd make a diagonal or ju you just make a cut down the center of it you take that cut you go about an inch i'm going to leave my knife in there or actually i'll take this and, and then um you take the scion wood and what you're going to do is you're going to cut it down to a point so um one of the things with doing um with making grafting cuts is you just want to make sure it's all one pull. Uh, you don't want to whittle away. And you know, I can see here, this isn't very good uh, scion wood. There's a lot of brown underneath the bark, um, which could be winter damage or it could be damage from, um, from storing them through the winter. So I'm going to keep going until I find something good. All right, here we go. All right, so now I've, I'm yeah. Sorry. Did you just say that the grafting will grow two to three feet this year? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, another question, how thin can the scion be? Oh, pretty thin. Um, I wouldn't do anything smaller than an eighth of an inch. Um, typically the timing of the year, um, you know, I'll, I'll try to do all my grafting sort of beginning of April. And um, sometimes if you do that, um, if it's too thin, it can freeze and you can actually kill it off. That makes sense. So, all right, so I've made this cut and you can actually see that this side is thicker than this side because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into that cleft and I'm gonna pry it open with the knife and I'm gonna slide it down. And what I'm trying to do, let's turn this a little. So you can see that that wedge shape is being pinched by the branch. And I, I'm lining up the cambial layer again. And so the grafting that they were doing sort of during the 18th century, they were just taking uh, Cecil. They would, you know, you make your first cut and you pinch it and you're wrapping it around up a little bit and so this is just to hold the graft in place and then you would usually just finish it off uh, with just like a, a hitch or a half hitch ah, that's good trim off the extra. Then um, what they're doing is uh, they would make their own grafting sealant. So this is a recipe that's found uh, from Downing's Fruit and Fruit Trees of America from 1845. Uh, and it's three parts rosin, three parts beeswax, and two parts lamb's tallow, which I don't know why. Uh, would necessarily need lamb's tallow but um so you would just sort of coat the whole surface of this um so what this is doing is it's sealing the graft and making it airtight and it's also holding that twine in place probably have a little too much there Um, so I made this uh, grafting wax. Um, so I tried all these different varieties, but I like this downing uh, recipe better. So um, yeah, that's how a graft would look from a couple hundred years ago. So we'll move Sam, was that this, one. Was this cherry graft called the cleft graft? Yep, yep, C-L-E-F-T. And are you gonna do bud grafting as well as scion grafting? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll uh we'll do that right now actually. Okay, so um we're back to plums and these are uh two uh plums that I had from uh from last year that I didn't have anything to grab to, so I just potted them, uh, so we have them now. Before I move on though, I just want to um, go back to the cleft graft for a minute. So these are actually cleft grafting tools. Um, you can kind of see there's, they're actually huge. And you can, they call it top working. So let's say I had a plum or apple variety that I didn't, um, that I wanted to change over, I wasn't happy with the variety. I could saw the top of it, take this and a hammer, pound down. I use this point to pry it open, and use the same process of uh, you know inserting the scion wood into it. The um, so some of the other things that I have here are actually budding knives, and we'll start to use some of these. And the other thing that I'm doing that I should talk about, so this is a rag that's soaked in alcohol. 
And you notice between every cut and between every different variety, I'm wiping down all of the tools. And that's so that I'm not communicating anything from one tree to the next. Oh, here's another thing that we should, well, we'll do this graph. So I'll show you the process that I use for, uh, for grafting my trees. Since the varieties that I'm working with are usually pretty hard to find, um, I kind of do my own insurance policy. So what I'll do is I'll first do this uh, whip graft that we first did. Can we get the camera as close as we can to this? Yeah, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so right. again, I made that one inch cut. I'm gonna go in and put a notch here. Okay, so uh, this next variety is uh, Monsieur Hatif, um, which is a French variety, again, brought over in the, um, I think this is like around 1800. So there was the Prince Nursery that was in um, Flushing, but there was also Michael Floy, who had a nursery in um, Harlem. And he was one of the first to um, offer this variety. So, you can see, um, in this case, I'm working with different size stock, right? So this is actually a little bit smaller than this, but I'll still go this, through the same process of making the notches. But what I'll do is when I put them together, I'm going to offset them, right? Because what I'm trying to do is match up the cambial layer. So I'm matching up here, matching up here. Let me slide these together like that. How long does it take to heal after you've? Um, about seven to ten days. Yeah. So if I'm, uh, you know, sort of my grafting window for spring is. Well, that, this is obviously in Syracuse. So. Uh, it's about April 1st to about second or third week in May, depending on the winter. Um, but if I put a graft in sort of beginning of May, I, I expect it'll start to push growth within about 10 to 14 days. And a lot of that has to do, um, you can greatly uh, in, improve your percentages if you water your trees. So what I'll do before I graft a tree is I'll, I'll come out and I'll, I'll water the tree to make sure that there's uh, plenty of moisture and nutrients running through the, the trunk. So, um, let's see, what the hell did I do? Oh, oh there it is. That's a cherry. All right. Well, we'll do it on the next one. Okay, um, Okay. so since the varieties I'm working with are pretty, uh, pretty rare, um, what I'll do in spring is I'll do a graft where I'll put a bud graft below it. So what I did is I just made a downward diagonal cut, take this way. Now I'm going to go above it. Oh, you can't. Okay. I'm going to go. Here, I'll show that again. Use a longer piece. Hey, Sam, this came up in the chat, and I have to say I share this view. Um, some of our, some of us, our kitchen training is always cut away from yourself. Do you have any tips and tricks for how to use these knives, these sharp objects, safely? Yeah, I know that's that's always been a problem for me, like with a lot of doing these. Um, so if I'm doing one of the cuts, uh, like a whip cut, what I'm doing is I just hold the knife and I pull the branch away from me. So I'm not actually pulling back towards me. I found that works really well because a lot of this sign wood after it sits for a few months, um, that it gets really thick, really hard, and um, you need the strength of pulling it apart, whereas trying to make that downward and away cut is really difficult. Um, 
for for doing um, a cut for budwood, what I do is you'll always notice that I keep my thumbs together. So that way, as I'm cutting, it's like physically impossible for me to stab my my other thumb. So um, yeah, sorry, that's all I have. <laughs> And suggested that maybe a cutting glove. Do you know of any sort of gloves like that? Yeah, there's cutting gloves and cutting knives. Um, you know, I, yeah, I think a lot of it is, is I just, you sort of get used to it. Like you, like using this technique where you, you're not, you know, probably to start off with one of the things that I did when I was first starting and, um, cutting the tips of my fingers a lot is I would just wrap them in electrical tape, um, which I found was, was pretty practical. So um, for doing this, um, for cutting uh, a shield, so this is, we're gonna do what the chip butting. So uh, for chip butting, what we're doing is we're making a downward cut. I guess that goes in about a quarter of an inch. Then I go about an inch above the bud. And what I'm doing is I'm cutting underneath it and I'm cutting away what they call a shield. Okay, so this is a growth bud. And what differentiates a growth bud from a blossom bud is that the growth bud is actually gonna have a point to it. Um, and flowering buds are, are gonna be more round. With stone fruit, what that looks like is you have the pointed bud in the center and then the, the blossoming buds would be on either side of it. So as long as you get that center bud, that's what you're looking for. So what I'm doing is I'm holding it onto my knife right now until I pick it up. And what I want to avoid is touching the bottom side of the graft because the bottom side of the, if your skin can transfer oils to the, the bottom side of the graft, uh, which can contaminate it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to swing this over here so you can get a better view of it. So I have, uh, this is my, my grafting bud. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to try to match that same cut. All right, got a little out of hand there, but so you can see I match that downward angle. So what I can do is slide that in. And let's do that again. Make it look a little better. Actually, we'll do it on this tree. Okay, I'm gonna make that downward cut. All right, so we have a notch and we slide that in. And you can see that bud shield will fit just perfectly and line up with both sides of the cambium. And for doing that kind of graft, what I'll do is I'll use uh, parafilm. So uh, this is a paraffin wax uh, tape. And so you can find it, um, Orchard Supply Places, um, you can find it online, but it's called Parafilm. And um, I'll do this away from the camera. I wet the end of the tape. What I'll do is I'll hold that, hold the end of the tape right here. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to wrap this perfectly. Um, so that, again, it's airtight. So no water is going to be able to get in there. Quick question. Is that cut on a bud on the rootstock as well or anywhere? Um, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So do you, could you repeat the question? I'm not sure. The question was, is that cut on a bud on the rootstock as well or anywhere? So you can, um, you can place them anywhere. Yeah. So I'm going to show uh, how to top work an entire tree. And so you can do that on the ends of branches too. So let's say you had a tree that had five or six branches. You could do it there. Um, I'll, I do it on the rootstock. And, you know, so I'll have sort of this tongue graft or whip graft right here. And then Typically what I'll do is I'll just go in and put in a 
I'll put in um, this bud graph below it. So if the the graft is too big, what I'll do is I'll just make a cut to make it make it fit. And so for really rare varieties that I'm trying to to make sure that I get, because you know I might not be able to get the cyanwood again, I'll uh, I'll do this whip graft, but then I'll also do a bud graft below it to make sure I get it. And part of that is also uh just comes from experience i've had you know there's plenty of birds here um and i've had birds that have landed on the top scion wood and lost it so this is kind of like my little insurance policy all right so um that's chip budding and chip budding is used uh a lot up here, um, you know, and by up here, I mean sort of central northern New York. And we, we sort of use that process because we don't have to worry about, about it getting too hot. But if you're in a climate where it gets warm, um, you can also do, um, you can do another type of bud grafting, which is tea budding. So this is a budding knife. This is actually my new French budding knife. <laughs> uh, very excited about this. Um, notice how it has a flat edge and it has uh, this uh, just sort of knob here, also has a piece here. And um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a T-bud. And to do that, um, what you do is you make this first cut here. I'm gonna kind of rechange position because it's easier. So what I did is I made just a cut that goes, I don't know, I guess that's about a third of the way across the um, across the trunk. I'm gonna start about an inch down and I'm gonna come up. And what I did is I just drug this cut to come up an inch. Then I can use either this part of the knife or this part of the knife to start to separate it. What I'm doing is I'm just pulling back the bark. So pulling away that outer bark and that inner bark. Let's see, Let's try to do this so I can show you. So see how I've pulled that away? And typically this, these trees are in the ground, so you're doing this all upside down. So we've worked that back. I'll close it back up till I'm ready to put the the butt in. So you will take this. And um, for doing this type of cut, what I'll do is the butt is right here. I'll go just above it. I'm gonna cut across. What I'm gonna do is then I'm gonna cut underneath it. Okay, again, I'm trapping it on my knife. I'm gonna hold it. Try to grab it without touching it. And what you'll see on on this bud actually is that you'll see like this, the part that I scooped. So the flat sort of pointed part is below the bud. So that that way, I come in and I separate this. I then take the bud and I slide it down underneath that bark. Oops. This is looking rough. One's a little hard to see as well, Sam. Yeah, yeah. we'll probably do this one again. Um, so you can see that um, what I did is I took this bud shield and I just slid it in that opening, but we'll, we'll show this one again. 
Um, I'll just do another one right down here. Or let's do it on the back. Okay. Make sure I have everything. All right. So what I'm going to do is cut a third of the way across. I'm going to cut down an inch. Okay. Do that. Then what I'm going to do is come over and prep the the bud that I'm going to graft with. And so I can just even hold it up to here. I'm going to cut across. Then what I'm going to do is come down below and I'm just going to try to scoop that growth bud off. You see? I'm going to hold that in my hand. Then I can take the knife and I can use that point on the knife. I can use this point. And what I'm going to do is I'm just trying to pull back the bark. So see how the bark is separated? And then I take that pointed part of the bud and I'm just gonna slide this down. Okay, see where we're at now? I just take this and I keep pushing it down like that. Then with the excess, I'll just take the knife Trim off the excess, and now I'm ready to tape it. And for this one, you'll, yeah, go ahead. Is this the inversion of what you cut, the flat side up? Yeah, so right here is the growth bud. So the growth bud always points up. Um, yeah, and essentially it's just, uh, I, I'll show you the cut for the bud again. And for this one, what I'll do is I'll just wrap the whole graft, right? And what will happen is once that bud starts to take, it'll push through the parafilm. One of the nice things with the parafilm is that it, it just breaks down uh, due to the elements. So uh, the growth bud will actually push through it. So for doing that, um, for doing this graft again, maybe we'll just do another version of it down here. Okay. All right. So what I'm gonna do is just cut third. Go down about an inch and a half. Then I'm going to go over to the budwood. And I'm going to find a piece of wood. So this is a good growth bud. And what I'm doing is I'm cutting straight across the top. Then what I'm doing is going down below it. And see how I'm trying to scoop beneath it. So that, that end is flat right there. Is there a reason that you use um, parafilm and not electrical tape for grafting? Well, for doing the, um, for doing whip grafts or cleft grafts, I'll actually use the electrical tape. For doing any type of bud graft, I'll use parafilm. So. Do the buds always point up? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There, <laughs> the first one of the first couple years when I was doing it, I actually grafted a uh, a branch upside down, um, which it makes for a really interesting looking tree. But um, yeah. Yeah, you always want to make sure that the, the growth buds are pointing up. Otherwise, the tree kind of like, it starts to look more like a pine with 
the growth branch is pointing down. So you can see I've separated, so we'll just get back to this. Um, I pulled away the, the bark, exposing the cambium, and now I'm taking this bud and that sharp edge is actually pointing down. Again, trying not to touch the bottom side of the of the growth and slide this down into place. Use the back side of the knife to push it down a little. Let's reset that. There we go. Okay, so I have a little bit extra of the bud that I just cut off. And then I just wrap the whole thing with parafilm. So there is actually another, you could, you know, if you don't have parafilm, you don't have access to it. You can use, uh, they also use polypropylene tape. So let's grab some of that. So uh, this is polypropylene. It's also the same material that sandwich bags are made out of. Um, so if you don't want to buy, uh, you know, buy grafting tape, you can actually make it from plastic bags. For that, I'm just going to go. I'm going to wrap it around. And what I'll do is. Do another cut. For this uh, parafilm, you can just smooth it against itself and it heals. But for the polypropylene tape, you're going to need to to tie it off, trim off the excess. So one of the dis another disadvantage with polypropylene is that um, you'll also need to come back and remove the tape um, two to three weeks after you make the graft. So it'll heal and you'll just make a small cut along the side. And typically you'll want to do that on the northern side. And that's so that the sun doesn't get, doesn't affect the cut. And you would just come and you'd cut the tape away like this. Um, but again, with parafilm, you just go. that and since it adheres to itself i can just do that so um both the chip budding which we did here and uh the tea budding those can be done in spring uh, again starting in april going through about mid-may but then they can also be done again in sort of mid-july to the end of august so most uh, peach trees are are grafted in August in one of these two ways. They'll either be uh, chip bud or tea bud. And what you do is you put the grafts on and, and sometime between mid-July to the end of August, you let it heal throughout the winter. You come back in sort of, you know, towards the end of winter and you would cut it cut the top of the tree off and then these would become growth buds and you've grafted the peach tree but that's pretty much only done with with peach trees um you know plums apples pears are all pretty much done grafted this way so all right so now we'll um move over to um top working trees. So I'm going to pull out another tree. All right. It is. All right. 
Okay. So um, what I'm going to do for this tree is uh, graft a bunch of varieties that originated in New York. So um, for making these multi-grafted trees, take this tree guard off. Okay, so if you look right here, uh, this was a graph that was done about three years ago. And um, you can see that it grew up. And just to give you an idea, this is an example of a graph that was done about seven or eight years ago. This part right here is the initial branch. So I don't know probably hard to pick up on the camera but you can see right here is the the original root system right here is where the graft was put into place and then the tree just grew up around it so if we're doing multi-grafted trees what i'll do is grow them two to three years until they have um three or four different uh scaffolding branches so those are branches that come out to the side this tree, what I did is I actually uh, pruned off and I harvested some of this wood um, to use for grafting somewhere else. And the base tree is actually, uh, it's a yellow egg. And um, it's, it's an old European variety that nobody really knows where it originated from. They think it might be from Holland where it was known as the white magnum bonum. Um, but. Yeah, so we just call it yellow egg. And um, the varieties that I'm going to graft to it are all gauge style plums. So uh, gauge plums are actually fresh eating plums. Uh, I really haven't seen any in markets in the US. Uh, you'll see them in, in Europe pretty often, but they're specifically designed for fresh eating, which makes them different than uh, prune plums which are often dried and um, used for prunes. So the first one we're gonna graft, I know somebody had mentioned what's the smallest you can graft and this is starting to, to really kind of push it. Um, I don't know, that's just like a little bit more than an eighth of an inch. And this is uh, called the Washington gauge, which uh, it has, there's two stories about its origin. Um, one is that it came from the farm of Henry Brevoort. Um, essentially, this person used to own a farm that uh, spanned the entire Bowery. And they say that uh, there was a lightning that struck a, uh, struck a tree and this came up from the root system. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make, again, try to replicate that diagonal cut like this. So you'll see some, uh, some wood inside. I don't know, it looks like it's going to affect the cut, so I'll just clear that out. I'll try to get the smallest branch that I have. And I'm going to bend that, and I'm going to try to match that cut. All right. I'll go through, make that diagonal cut. See, I'll slide over here. I'm gonna match that. Ooh. Like that. So again, the cyan wood is uh, a little bit smaller, so I'll set it off to the side.
Hey, Sam, can graphs go on to other graphs? Oh, yeah. That's how, you, that's how I build, the, uh, build trees. So um, it's a good time to talk about compatibility. Um, so obviously, uh, peaches can graft to peaches, apricots to apricots. Um, odd things are that you can graft an apricot to a peach, but it's difficult to graft a peach to an apricot. A lot of it all has to do with the cellular structure of the fruit variety. So Asian plum varieties graft readily to Asian plum varieties, but don't graft well to European varieties. So what you would need to do uh, to make that work is use, they call them inner stocks. And what I'll use is an inner stock. So let's say I'm trying to graft a European plum to an Asian plum. I'll actually use Mirabilin root stock, right? And I'll trim a branch off of it. I'll graft it on just like this, let it grow for a year or two. And then I'll be able to graft on that European variety onto an Asian plum. Does that make sense? Um, then, I mean, there's also, um, you know, if I'm trying to graft peaches to, to a plum, you know, what I'll have to do is I'll typically use a, a rootstock variety that uh, is compatible with both. So I, I can use like a level rootstock or I can use a variety called St. Julian, um, which is a European plum variety, but it's compatible with most stone fruits. So as I'm, I'm looking at this graph, I'm gonna count up three or four growth buds. And with the, the top growth bud, I want it to point in the direction where I want the branch to go. Uh, so, I'm looking at this one, which is pointing up. I'll just make that last cut. Go from there. Then, uh, I'm sorry. pardon? Well, the bud's not taken unless you cut off the old growth above it. Um, no, it just, I think, um, you know, what it does is there's a certain amount of energy that the, uh, that the root system is going to send up. And just by keeping the graph smaller, you're sending um, more of the nutrients to just a select amount of growth as opposed to you know, five or six different buds that are on the branch. All right. And then what I'll do is I'll just go through. Um, so I use these things, which is I love the name Impresso Tag. Um, so you can either write on them with a ballpoint pen. Um, and then I'll just label out all the branches. This is a great question about that in the chat. Um, how do you tag document identification of the bud graph? Yep. So it's these tags. And then what I'll also do is I draw diagrams of each of the trees. Um, so I'll number the tree and then also uh, have a diagram of it because it's not uncommon, you know, for these in a windstorm to blow off. And so that's another way to kind of make sure that you're still, you still have all the varieties. So the next one we're going to graft is a uh, green gauge plum. So uh, this is like among people that know fruit. Um, this is considered one of the best, if not the best fruit, period. Um, it has this extraordinary taste and um, originated sometime before the 1600s in France, and it was known as the Rhine Claude. Um, it got, it's interesting because this is where it ties into how do you identify things. Um, there was a guy, Thomas Gage, who went to France. He found this plum. Um, was bringing it back to England, lost all the tags, so renamed all of them gauge plums. And that's how they became known for a while. Uh, and this is sort of the parent of almost all of the gauges. So uh, 1783, William Prince in Flushing plants out, uh, he takes the seeds, takes about a dozen seeds from, from the Rhine Claude plum, plants them, and uh, originates varieties like this, which is the imperial gauge. Uh, and
and several other gauge varieties that were really well known in New York and, and sold throughout the markets in the, the 19th century. So we'll just do another cut here and try to match it with the branch. Turn this so you can see better. Okay. Notch here. Notch right here. Again, keeping the thumbs together. So sometimes when you're using thicker branches, what you'll have to do is when you make that notch, just push, uh, pry it open a little bit. Okay, so you can see there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of the scion with the tanging over. And that's okay, you can just come in and just take that, just turn that off. So with doing these graphs, what I'll do is I'll also, I start the tape at the bottom and I'm pulling it really tight um, to get it to hold in place. And there's a lot of buds clustered there. So I'll just do that. So again, if it's a variety that um, I wanna make sure that, that I get, I don't lose. What is it? Um, what I'll do is I'll do the, the whip graft, but then I'll also come in and do a, a bud graft below it. So go like this, do it here. Okay. Remove that. I do is go in right here and put a bud or try to match that cut to put in the bud graft. Slide that in place. So if the, the bud graft is a little off, um, actually, let's do this. If the bud graft is a little bit smaller, Again, what you'll do is push it off to the side to get it to match the cambium. So there's a little bit that's exposed over here, but as long as you're lining up one side, the other advantage with the bud graft too is that you're getting all of the contact on the back of the bud. So like right here. We're wrapping this with the polypropylene tape. Hi, Sam. It's Mariana. I have a quick question. How much room for error is there when you're doing this? Like, is it really delicate to take or if you get it marginally in the right place, it'll work? Oh, it depends on how many years you have. <laughs> um, the, uh, usually, it, it, you know, if you're grafting in the same, uh, you know, grafting plum to plum, your your percentage rate of the takes goes up dramatically. Um, I would say if you're you're looking to start with grafting, start with apples. Apples, I mean, if they're like get, just get near each other, they graft pretty readily. So um, yeah, apples are a good place to start, and then um, yeah, then obviously grafting plums to plum, peaches to peaches. But you know, do it for a couple of years, you can get it to like almost ninety nine percent. Um, okay, so I think I have one last thing to show you, um, 
which is called a bridge graph, which is pretty interesting. And I wanted to show it to people, show people the process during the last workshop, but it didn't, uh, we sort of ran out of time. Um, so I guess it's odd to get excited about graph, you know, about your new graphing technique, but this was the first time I did this. It was pretty interesting. So uh, as you notice, like I have all of my trees, they have tree guards on them. I ran out at the end of last year and I had two trees that um, I didn't put tree guards on. And of course, mice girdled the tree. So um, what happened during the winter, as you can see, obviously here's the bark. Um, here's the part where the, the mice gnawed away at the bottom of the tree and chewed away all of the bark. So what I did is a process called bridge grafting. And so I collected uh, branches. I had scion wood from apple trees and I grafted it into the bottom, grafted it up here and it essentially saves the tree. So just by putting these three graphs in, I got all of this growth. Um, otherwise, the problem is, is I would have lost the tree entirely uh, because there's no, no way for the nutrients to, to travel from the root structure up to the top. But I thought that was pretty neat. I read it in a book and um, you know, unfortunately needed the opportunity to try it, but that's bridge grafting. So, yeah, I guess, uh, um, any questions? Lots of questions for you, Sam. There's also a lot of appreciation for you in the chat. Thanks so much. This is an amazing Thank you. presentation. A couple of quick questions about scions. Can you show how to harvest a scion? Do you just cut, cut them off or is there a process for it? That's a great question. Okay, so um, I'll move this out of here. All right, so when I'm collecting scions, um, what I'll do is I'm always looking for the previous year's growth, right? So you want everything that grew from the year before. I'll collect them typically in the middle of January when I know the trees are dormant. And um, what you want to do is start looking for what they call the water spouts. So water, you can see all of the trees that I do are open center. And what I'll do is I'll head the tree off when it's two or three years old and try to get this vase shape to it so that I can graft onto these end branches. What will inevitably happen is there will be growth buds that come up out of the center of this tree, right? And those will grow sort of two to three feet tall. What I'll do in January when I come out to harvest the branches is I'll take and remove that year's growth, right? So I'll prune that out. What I'll do is, so let's say this is three to four feet long. I will take the center of the branch. The center is uh, the buds are the most developed, but they're not overdeveloped and starting to grow. I'll take that center portion. I, use, I had these bags, um, I ordered these bags specifically, but you could use any plastic bag that you can seal. Um, I'll take old washcloths and I'll, I'll dampen it. You don't want it, you know, you want to wring it out so no more water is going to um, come from the, the cloth. Take the branch in it, get all the air out, and then put a twist tie on it, stick it in the fridge. You don't want to put it in the refrigerator with apples or bananas. Uh, both of those off-gas, and if they off-gas, they can contaminate the scion wood. Um, I keep these, um, you know, if you have a beer refrigerator or something along those lines. Um, it's kind of perfect for it. You store them in there. You can keep them from January through, I've, I've taken cyan wood and used it to graft in July. So that sort of. Is the cyan useless after you cut all the buds off it? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, the buds are the only thing that you're trying to, to harvest with it and use. Other questions? There are some questions. One of the uh, <laughs> right here, let's see if you um, answer this if you like. 
Um, what was your grafting success rate when you first started versus now, years later? <laughs> Horrible. Um, I was bad. Um, yeah, I, I'd say the probably like I was lucky to get half of them when I first started. Like apples, I I could graft pretty pretty easily when I first started, but stone fruit are kind of they're they're a lot more difficult and a lot more finicky. So I would say when I first started, my success rate was around fifty percent. Now, you know, it's ninety-five to ninety-nine percent success rate. Um, where where the success rate really kind of falters is when you're grafting between varieties, and so that's taken me, I don't know, what ten years to kind of. Um, figure out the compatibility between all of these varieties to know what will graph to what. Um, and because like the learning curve for it is like two or three years, right? Yeah, the graph might take, but it might not produce fruit. So you have to, you know, sometimes it's three, four years before you even know if the graft was truly successful. Um, this question came up early on when you were, um... Oh, well, here's another one, a specific one. Can we graft onto an elderberry or a crab apple? Um, <laughs> it's funny, I have no knowledge of anything other than temperate fruit. Um, and even that, I feel like, I don't know, every, you know, I tell people it's like every year, um, I know you, you said I was a fruit expert, but every year I'm like a complete novice. Um, I, I, it's like, I'm always learning something every year that reminds me how much I don't know. So when it comes to anything other than temperate fruit or like uh, stone fruit, apples, pears, like I'm ignorant. Um, I can say that crab apple is actually used uh, for rootstock for apples. So um, as apples uh, were starting to be grafted, they would graft onto sort of the native crab apples and um, you know, and use those as the rootstock. And I guess that's one of the reasons um, why you're going to actually want to use rootstock is because the rootstock generally tend to uh, adapt better to different soil conditions. Um, so, I mean, if, if you were like so, um, so inclined, you could actually develop your own rootstock for your own region um, by planting out seeds, whichever one was more vigorous, grew better. Um, you know, you could use as a rootstock. But in terms of elderberry, I no idea. Japanese maples came up as well. Um, there's a few yeah. other specific ones. Totally within my knowledge gap. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was the question I was about to ask earlier. How would you know when you were um, grafting, how would you know that the tree that you're grafting from has been tested and disease free if they're not, you know, in that cluster that you know and that you've tested really well? Like that's, yeah, that's always the, the kind of dilemma. Like I'm fortunate, right? So I have like, here is where I keep all the trees that were tested. Luckily I have a, another spot where I can grow the tree and then send the samples to get them tested. Um, usually if you talk to the, um, to the nursery, wherever you're buying them. So, you know, if you're buying rootstock, um, they have a particular variety called Cert Moreau, which is certified Mirabilin rootstock uh, that you can purchase. So a lot of times, you know, right off the bat. Um, other times you can, you can talk to the grower. Sometimes they'll tell you, sometimes they don't. Um, I don't think it's necessarily, a, it's not that big of an issue unless you are, so I harvest from these trees and will graft them in, um you know throughout the state obviously i don't want to be i i don't want to be transferring any disease which is why i'm like so crazy about having them tested and making sure that they're disease free but if this is all going into your backyard um i'd say use best practices as you can and kind of go from there okay. there's a few more stone fruit questions let me see there's um Question in the chat about, we have like a 20 foot tall apple tree. Can we graft to a branch of that? Same question for a peach tree. Okay. Um, 
All right, so this is gonna be a really bold move. Um, it's gonna be like a two-year process for you. So if you have a 20-foot tree, um, it's gonna have a bunch of growth on it. And it's gonna be hard to put a graft on there that's gonna be really successful. Um, so what I would recommend is, you know, on a 20-foot tree, probably about four or five feet up is this branch union, right? And what you would do is, or at least what I would do, I would go in um, in January and I would prune it like probably five or six feet up. So if I just drew a line here, that's what I would prune at. Then that year, what I would do is let all the branches grow and you would get all, you know, previous, get all that year's growth that you can graft to and graft onto this as opposed to grafting onto the old old growth. You can get away with grafting on two-year-old wood, but really you want it to be that previous year's growth. So I think that makes sense. So essentially what you're doing is you're cutting like a line across the top of the tree. You're letting um, new growth develop, and then you would graft to that new growth. Um, more questions about testing. Where are you sending these trees for testing? And if when you're testing, do you test all the grafts on a single tree? Yeah, you have to. So you would, yeah, you're testing all the leaf samples on a single tree. Um, it's, you know, you send them to a company named Agdea. That's where I was having a lot of testing done. I think they're in Indiana. Um, you collect eight leaves off a branch, send it, and they do like what they call a whole prunus screen um and yeah it's and this is where it gets really expensive because it's like two hundred dollars per eight leaf sample um yeah and i mean that's a problem that that we have you know yeah with a lot of these trees so generally if you can get them from a, a really good source i know that um i don't know if they're they're selling to individuals but um uc davis has foundation plant services and um so that's a good place to to order scion wood from because that's stuff that's all been tested and ready to go out for uh you know two two orchards to plant out as um you know for commercial growth and commercial use that's it's one good place for stone fruit, but again, they don't have like any of the older varieties or just a few of them anyway. Um, another question, under what conditions would you do scion grafting versus bud grafting? In other words, why would you do one over the other? Yeah, I mean, I pretty much, um, I, I mostly use scion grafting. Again, I'll use that same process where I'll, I'll graft the scion and then the bud below it. Um, yeah, and you can just, yeah, once you get that down, you, you can use it over and over on, on the trees. But that, that's pretty much my process at this point. It's it, it was a lot of trial and error because for a while I was grafting scions in spring and then bud grafting in August. And I don't know, like, I don't know if it's just here or the growth rate of the trees, but I wasn't having a whole lot of success with doing summer budding. So now I pretty much just do most of the grafting in April and I'll save August for summer pruning to thin out branches. Okay. Um, there's a question about native plants. Thank you from Chantal. Thank you, Chantal. It's glad to have you with us. Um, the fact that these trees or originated in New York, but it's been so long since they grew, how easily will they reacclimate? Under the current conditions, are they considered native? Yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, that that's a question, right? I mean, if if you're going with the strict definition of native, so then the only ones that, that truly are native are the Prunus americana, right? So that's that's the American plum variety, the Prunus maritima, um, and crab apples, and and so you know uh, that's sort of like the the dark history of this, like these trees are the product of colonialism. Like that's how they, they travel, but it becomes interesting in terms of their, I mean, people's stories are, are sort of embedded within that. And that's the thing that becomes interesting to me. It's sort of like this one, um, 
I have this one variety called Smith Orleans, and it comes from a Mrs. Smith in Gowanus who grew one of the first varieties uh, that, you know, that was, you know, grown in her neighborhood. She took a seed of that, grew this variety that became a major variety in the 19th century. And so, you know, just trying to research and go back to her history um, and, and find out sort of her story because these are people that were just doing it in their backyard. And um, a lot of times it would just be for subsistence, but then it became something that's, um, you know, that actually became, you know, pretty popular and tasted really well. As far as um, growing conditions, I mean, that that's something that we're actually testing on Governor's Island. Uh, originally, the thought was about 10 years ago that with global warming, we would be able to grow uh, fruit varieties that are um, based more in the from the mid Atlantic region, and um, but what we're finding is the weather's becoming a lot more erratic. So you you know uh, we were talking uh, before this started, where um, the you know it snowed here two days ago, and I've lost half of my fruit because of it. And for that reason, I'm finding that I have to grow varieties that are actually more accustomed to a colder climate and will break dormancy later in the year. So um, that's kind of like a research aspect uh, of the orchard um, on Governor's Island. Have you done air layering on fruit trees? No, no, uh, I have that. There are some more specific questions, let me see. On the tagging identification, there's um. Can you commercially graft a pink lady apple to a multi-graft apple tree? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't see why you wouldn't. Um, and is all the there's a question when you were grafting? Is all the contact on the back of the bud? On the back of the bud, yeah. So yeah, I you're not doing anything to the bark. You know, it's all sort of you know you're essentially just scooping it out so the knife is is the point of contact for it yeah right um there's a question about a lemon tree um someone in the chat has a six foot lemon tree in her home which she just moved outside she'd like to have a fully tree with more blossoms can she cut off the top branches and just put them on the lower branches oh i don't well I, you know again like lemon trees are like completely outside uh, my knowledge base, but you should be able to. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> Someone else has a couple of multi-grafted apple trees grown on EMLA111 rootstock. What are your yeah. thoughts on growing it in a container? It's gonna be tough for that, um, that rootstock, because that's, I, I'm pretty sure that's a standard size tree. Um, which means that, that that tree is intended to grow like 20 to 30 feet. Um, and so you, you definitely want to put that in the, in the ground. And then what I would do is look for a dwarfing, uh, you know, dwarfing rootstock to use for, for planters. So one thing you could do now is just get uh, some dwarfing rootstock, put it into the planter, and then graft those varieties over to it in a year or two. Um. Gonna, there are a few more really specific questions in the chat. Let me see if I can find okay. them. Um, someone noted yesterday that the apple trees in their garden have some curled leaves from caterpillars or some other pest. Any idea what that might be? Should they remove the affected leaves or do some other treatment? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah so, uh, yeah, first thing is go in, cut those branches out. What I'll do is, like, I, I need this thing that fits, like, a uh, one of those shopping bags too, uh, just like a ring. So you can just cut off the leaf and it drops into the bag and it doesn't hit the ground. Um, and that, that's really, you want to make sure you're doing that with any kind of insects you're pruning out of the trees is make sure none of that hits the ground. Um, yeah, prune it, prune it out now. And then what I would do is uh, start, uh, you know, I'd spray it with neem oil which is a fungicide and also an insecticide and it's an organic treatment um you know follow the directions on the label but generally what it's going to tell you is to go on like a 10 to 14 day uh spraying cycle 
Um, usually, you know, the problem with, with fruit trees is that you only see the problem long after the, the disease is set in place. Um, so yeah, I, I would say go with an organic treatment, hit it with some neem oil and see what happens. Thank you, Sam. We're going to wrap it up now. Um, okay, great. There's been some questions about uh, resources, tools, and materials that you need. We can share those. The nurseries that you mentioned, we'd love to share those with all the participants after the chat. Um, they're too modest to say it, so I'll mention that Sam and Shane are working on a book forthcoming from Timber Press. You can look out for that. I know you've got, Sam, a lot of books that you could probably recommend. You mentioned a couple today. Um, so we'll ask for resources later um, and I'll welcome everybody to turn your video on and say hi and say goodbye to Sam. I'm take a look. Like said, there's a lot of appreciation for you in the chat. Oh. My favorite one being, this is so much better than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mama Tanya. That's good. I, didn't... Um, I don't know. Looking forward yeah. to oh, reading your book. Um, uh... Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for participating in this. And um, we'll see you at the next one. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.